Hello, this is Joe McGee. You know, we've been doing seminars across the country for years. Seminars on marriage, parenting, men, money, and family. We want to encourage you to email us and let us know if this podcast has helped you. Or maybe you have joined us live at one of our seminars. If you have a testimony, you just want to tell us what God's doing in your life, please email us at mail at joemcgeeministries.com or you can contact us through our website, joemcgeeministries.com. There you will find helpful articles and tools to help you grow in God, your marriage, and your family. We love you guys. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Hello, everybody. It's Joe and Andrew here today. Welcome to another Mailbag Monday. We've got some great questions that have been submitted. We're going to have a good time today, aren't we, Angel? Yes, we are. And thank you again for submitting your questions and uh, for listening. We enjoy our time with you on Mondays. But let's jump right in here. So what are your thoughts on... On debt and tithing, is it right to not be paying bills but giving tithes? (laughs) This one is yours. (laughs) Well, I had to answer this for myself years ago. And uh, I would say for a long time, I said, I can't afford to tithe. I can't afford to tithe. I owe too much money. I can't afford to tithe. And, of course, I was uh, was in a good church at the time learning a lot about the Word of God. And, of course, I knew the story about the promised land that, to get into the promised land, there were like 10 major cities that God was going to give them, and uh, the first one was Jericho. And God told them that Jericho belongs to me. I'm going to give you this city so you can give it back to me. This will allow you to get the other nine cities. It's like sowing and reaping. God said, you got to have some seed to sow. God said, I'll give you seed to sow. So he gave them Jericho. He said, don't touch anything in this. This is all mine. But because... I'm going to give you this to give back to me. You get the rest of it. You get the whole other nine places. And so uh, I knew that. But, you know, I uh, got in debt up to my eyeballs, sold everybody their dog and a cat. So what I did, and I can't quote the description of this, I said, man, i got to start giving something. And I remember we took uh, an afternoon and we went through the couch, pulled out all the cushions, and uh, went through the truck and pulled the seat up, what change I dropped, and I think I gathered about a dollar eighty four cents, <laughs> and so seriously, so when we went to church uh, uh, that Wednesday night, uh, when they passed the offering bucket around. I dropped in my dollar eighty four cents. It was all changed, and it made noise. And I thought, and, and I had the thought, well, that's just embarrassing. I don't care. I'm, <laughs> I'm starting to tithe. I'll start right where I am. And so I tell people, where do you start? Right where you are. What have you got to give? Start. But the goal, and actually the biblical promise, is attached to 10%. It's not 11, it's not 7.5, it's, it's 10. It's a tenth. And, uh, you know, if you think about it, depending on how much money you make, you know, the government can take as much as, as 50% of your check, you know, in taxes. Right. God only asks for 10. That's a pretty good deal. That's a pretty good deal. So I tell people, start where you are. And, uh, of course, the other thing is I assume this is probably somebody that's married, maybe. And uh, so you got to get in agreement with your spouse because that's another, that's another war zone. But what about the paying the bills? Well, uh, you owe that. And so the way I looked at it was um, that's not my money to give. Uh, that's money I owe. And so when you say that, I'm just sorry to interrupt. Well, are you, you talking about the, the tithe or are you talking about the bills? At the t- when you have the tithe, the tithe was given at the end of the harvest time. Okay, we've done the wheat, we've done the soy, we bring everything in. When they brought it in to the store, the, that's when they found out what's 10%. Well, I first I have to have the load to find out what 10% of the load is. I don't have a load. I can't give you 10%. I don't have anything to give you 10% of. Right. I, I don't have anything to give you 10% of. And so I tell people, when you start start out, you realize, like, man, and I've been there. I've been twice in my life. I was there where I owed everybody ran up credit cards to the maximum, and then I'm paying more stuff, and I'm, you know, that 20, 22% interest going the wrong direction. And I realized this is my fault. I did this to me. But when they said, well, you need to tithe 10% of your income, my thought very simple was I have no income. Everything I'm, it's like when I worked, my father worked for a mining company. My grandfather worked for a mining company. We had a beautiful town, beautiful mining town. It wasn't like skanking, it was a copper mining town. So we went to the company store. It was the first Walmart. Mm-hmm. Long before Walmart was the company store. And like Tennis Journey Ford used to sing, I owe my soul to the company store. And so if you couldn't have it, if you didn't have the money, they just put it on your bill. And you're going to have to work for the mine until Jesus comes twice because you don't owe anything. 
you owe the company store. That's not mine. I owe them. And so uh, for me, just business, like, well, I need to give 10% of my income. I have no income. I have none. It's not mine. If I take percent, I'm stealing from what I already owe to somebody else to give to God. If, if I'm in debt, I'm, I'm saying, what am I going to do? Well, you need to pay your 10%. I don't have 10%. I owe these people. I did an agreement with these people where a credit card or I bought a car or a house. I owe, and you, you know, you swear to your own hurt, you know, which you promised to do, you got to do. I owe these people. That's what you need to do. I need to pay these people back because that's not my money. That's their money. I can't tithe off their money. It's not my money. That's their money that I owe. And so it's very simple. So I've taught this in financial seminars, and people just sort of stare at you. Give 10% of your increase. I have no increase. I'm in <laughs> debt up to my eyeballs. I have no increase. But I did have a knowledge of, I need to get out of this mess. Right. How are you going to do that? Well, I need to stop spending. Uh, reduce, maybe get a smaller house, smaller apartment, get rid of that big expensive car and find a junky used one for a while. No wear used clothes. I mean, I've gone down to the Salvation Army and bought clothes before. I know what it's like. We can do. We got to lay an ax to all this stuff. We got to stop the flood. Mm-hmm. The dam's got a hole in it. We got to stop this flood. We got to plug this hole up. And pretty soon you'll realize, oh, hey, man, we got an extra $10. I got a dollar tithe coming this Sunday. I'm, I'm going to take my tithe in. And we, I just thought real logical. So people say, what do you tithe? Well, you tithe 10% of your increase like God told the Israelis to do. When you bring your crop in, you owe 10% of that increase. And, of course, not everything made it back to the, you know, when you did wheat, not a lot of wheat made it all the way back to the, you know, place where you're going to sell it or where you're going to store it. Mm-hmm. Some fell off the side. Uh, that's why uh, the poor people, the widows, the unemployed were allowed to glean around the wheat fields or the soybean fields. What you do? When they harvest it, not everything got taken out. There's always a little row around the edge where they didn't get it, even modern farms. What you say? Well, there's a little row of wheat and got left, a row of cotton and got left. They didn't get all of it. So the poor people are allowed to go to the fields in the evening and glean the leftovers. Mm-hmm. So that's what the poor people did. And so when you got back down to it, I'm supposed to tithe. I believe in tithing. I'm a deep believer in tithing. I don't even have to sweat about it. That 10% is God so I can get the other 90%. My financial future is based on me being a tither. But when I started tithing, I didn't have anything to tithe. It's not my money. I got myself in debt. I owe Bill, Bob, Frank, Jim, you know, and, and I owe these people. That's not my money. Okay, so just to be clear on this, because I was taught differently. Yes. Because um, I was taught that even if I say I had, I say I got a going. paycheck for $1,500. Yes. And I owed $1,600. <laughs> <laughs> That that I would need to, you know, rob Peter to pay Paul, yep. kind of start playing these games. <laughs> That's why people to, do it. To, but I would tithe off of that $1,500. So what you're saying, though, is different. Yeah. That's not your money. I'm supposed to tithe off my increase. I have no increase. I'm in debt up to my eyeballs. I need to pay off my debt. The Bible says, oh, no man, nothing except to love him. And I owe everybody their dog. What are you going to do? I need to pay my debt. Now I believe in sowing seed. I believe in tithing to the hill. My future finance is based on my ability to give and tithe. But when you start, when you start, what are you? I don't have anything to tithe. I'm broke. Gotcha. I'm going to give you 10%. I don't have. Sears owns that <laughs> that money or, or the grocery store owns that money or the you know hardware store. They, I owe them. That's not my money. I got in debt. I don't have I don't have two percent. I don't have a half percent. I owe everybody their dog and a cat, and I need to pay them. Oh, nobody knows except the love them. So when I see people get real special. Well, I'm tithing now. You can't afford to. You don't have any money, which it means it's a wake up call. Stop the bleeding. Mm-hmm. That's what every financial seminar you realize. Well, how are we going to do this? Well, you need to probably get a smaller apartment or get rid of that big car or cut the cable. Cut the cable. Get rid of that stuff. You know, uh, you you can you know get rid of the expensive cell phone. Whatever it is you're doing, lay an axe to where the flood is. If the dam's leaking, plug the hole. Well, I sure wish you had have uh, told me this when I was a single mother. <laughs> <laughs> that could have alleviated a whole now, now, lot. Of- I tell people it's not the tithe. It's the faith behind the tithe. Mm-hmm. It, you know, you can tithe until Jesus comes in and will get you a thing if there's no faith involved. Right. Faith that works is dead. Work of that faith is dead. It's not just my tithe that I put in that offering plate, offering bucket, whatever you call it, it's my faith behind it. Because there are a lot of people that say, I tithed, I didn't get nothing. It's because you didn't have any faith mixed with it. 
there's no faith mixed with it. It's not going to produce a thing. Faith moves God. Faith stops the devil. Faith is the it's the it's the um, it's the cash coin of the spiritual world. Mm. What moves God? Faith. That's why Jesus talked about that widow woman that gave her last two miles. She said, "He said that woman gave more than anybody today." It's a faith thing. Mm-hmm. That woman, what'd you give? The last time, God. I got nothing left. I gave it all, but it was hers to give. She didn't owe it to Billy Bob Incorporated. Gotcha. It was hers to give, and so it's it's always a hard issue. So we trying to. Do? I realize I made a mess, but God will get me out. God said, "He'll deliver me. He'll redeem me. He'll get me out of this mess." But I need to start with me. Do everything you can, then God will do everything he can. So the faith of that works is dead. What's the first thing? I need to work and get out of this mess. So I need to reduce my cost of living somehow and get out of this thing. Then I want to get to where I can start tithing, and then I'll be a tither until Jesus comes. And I've been there. I have been. It's like, we do. I'm a tither now. I tithe. Now, of course, we support other people and, and certain missions and uh, missionaries, and uh, I'm a giver because this, this planet works off the law of seed time and harvest. If you don't plant it, you don't get it back. So you can't start hollering. Well, I need something. I need. We need to plant something. Well, I can't plant anything. It's because you're broke. So you need to you need to stop the bleeding. It's what God says. You, the walls of Jericho. God said, "I'm going to give you Jericho." But first of all, you're going to have to walk around those walls for seven days. Yeah. What for? Because I said so. Well, what's that got to do with the thing? Nah, it's got a lot to do with it. And God said, "Shut your mouth the whole time you're walking around the wall." Don't talk. What are we doing this for? Well, this is stupid. No, God said, shut your yap. No, because sin comes out of the mouth. You know, it's like, mm-hmm. don't say it. And then the last day, after you walk around, shout real loud. You're going to walk seven times that last day. And what happened? The walls fell down. The walls that were impenetrable, that were huge, that nobody could get over, that they were so wide, chariots could ride around the top of the walls. It's That's like, good. how are you going to knock this down? We're not an army. Well, we're going to just walk around and we're going to shout real loud. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! So I think that's where a lot of my kinfolk got it. Well, shout. Well, shout. Well, that's biblical. Shout. <laughs> <laughs> that's really good. I appreciate that. Uh, you have just corrected my theology. Thank you. Uh, You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> so do you have a suggestion for a translation of the Bible that is most plainly worded, yet doesn't change the original meaning? I do. My favorite is uh, the New Living Translation. I've I wore out so many of them. i got one sitting right on the table. Uh, they come in paperback. Uh, it's a one-year Bible, uh, and so you can get them in any bookstore. So I love the New Living Translation. It's a nice modern English. It's real close with the original. Now, I still I tell people I still study my King James Bible. I'm not left the King James. And um, and we were doing some, uh, a paper last night, and I was talking about you know, when they found the Dead Sea Scrolls in 48 in that cave over in Israel. Uh, when they started pouring through them, they realized that, uh, you know, because we have, we got, you know, it took 1,500 years and 40, 40 authors to get the Bible. It wasn't written in one weekend. It was mm-hmm. a 1,500-year process. 40 different people from different places didn't know each other. And so, yeah, when we got the we got the written word of God, you believe that's the real Bible? Yes, I do. Because when they found the Dead Sea Scrolls, they realized that it was 96% the same as the original writings from a thousand years earlier. So after a thousand years with no computers, no cell it was the exact same words. God wow. is not stupid. He will not be messed up. Humans cannot stop what God's going to do. Right. It is the living word of God. So you need to read it on a regular basis and feed on it. And so find something that you understand. So uh, like I said, my favorite, and people will debate this forever. Everybody's got their own favorite translation. So I like the New Living Translation. It's still my favorite, and I still read it every day. That yeah. is my favorite translation. I like it. I like the message, too. Yes, it's more, man. Message is a damn not entertaining. It's yeah. like a movie that's eight hours long. <laughs> <laughs> that one verse went for 12 pages. Man, how did they get so many words? But it, it is a great translation. Very entertaining. Yeah. All right. Well, my teenager asked me a question that I cannot answer. If God wanted us to believe in him or to understand him, why doesn't he just make it plain instead of everything having to be so mysterious and hidden? I simply do not have a good answer. Mm. Uh, God's a romantic. God's a romantic. Um, God loves to be chased. Hmm. The Bible says, uh, God told us that you draw close to me, I will draw close to you. If you seek me, I'll see that you find me. You ask me a question, I'll answer it. Mm. You knock on my door, I will open it up. You stare at me, I'll stare back. God wants us to 
use our faith. Mm -hmm. And so when God replaced one-third of the angels that fell, he replaced them with a human that was lower than an angel, but had authority over angels, believe it or not. Now, he, Adam didn't understand at the time. That's why he sinned and got fired, evicted, and his kids were killing each other. God's trying to set this up. God's very fair. Uh, if you'll think, people don't like this, but it's very entertaining. Uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, um, Jesus never asked anybody anything twice, ever. He said, would you like to follow me? Now I got to bury my dad. He said, let the dead bury the dead. Mm. You want to follow me? Now I got to go take care of my cow. And so Jesus said, no, you don't understand who I am, what I'm asking you. And he, but he never did. God wants people who want him. And so God said, I set before you life, death, blessing, cursing. You get to choose. And not everybody that's it, that I've ever met in my life is a Christian. The more you chase God, the more you understand. Like, man, I've read that passage 12 times. I, just, I finally got it. Right. Why? You got to study. You got to dig. You got to search. You got to want it. God wants people that want him. It's a very simple process. It's not hard, but you do have to dig. I tell people, gold's not laying on the surface. You got to get a shovel and a pick. <laughs> <laughs> You got to dig for the gold. You can get gravel on the surface. You use sandstone, but it's gold. You got to dig for that stuff. Same thing with oil in Oklahoma. Oklahoma. Where's the oil at? Well, it's deep. It's deep. You got to dig for it. You got to dig for it. Well, and the Bible says that the satisfied soul loathes the honeycomb, Ooh. but to the hungry man, every bitter thing is sweet. Oh, thank you, Jesus. So, mm -hmm. uh, and to me, that means I could read John three sixteen, and if I'm satisfied, it won't mean anything to me. But if I read, if I'm hungry for God and seeking after Him, and I read that, I could read it a hundred times, and it could have a new meaning to it's me. Like a firework depth. explosion going off. Yeah. So God, God wants hungry people. They set it up on purpose. Yeah. He set it up on purpose from day one. God wants to be chased. You yeah, draw He close does. To me. I'll draw close to you. I like that. That's good. <laughs> okay, one more for today. In our marriage, there is no question that the kids come first. Whoa. <laughs> I don't want to be selfish, but it seems they have, are always the ones being considered when it comes to issues. What is the balance? Whoa, that's a that's this is this is our society today. It is where we are today. Uh, you know, uh, I was born in 1951, and so in my day and age, uh, I remember I was in the sixth grade when a, a buddy, a kid called Danny Bean, uh, his mom, his mom and dad got a divorce. Mm -hmm. I knew nobody that had been divorced. I'm in the sixth grade. I didn't know people could get divorced. I didn't know what divorce was. Right. My mom I had to go home and have my mom explain to it. Well, they disagreed and they got divorced. And I said, I didn't know that was possible. There was no divorce in my family. My dad has 12 brothers and sisters. There is no divorce. And so all of a sudden today, like everybody's divorced, divorced four or five times. Like, what happened? Well, if we get close to the last days, the end times, perilous times will come. Men will be lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Heady, high-minded, truth breakers, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection. It's a long, skanky list. But at the same time, in the last days, God said, I'm going to pour my spit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters are going to prophesy. You're going to dream dreams. There's two barracudas swimming side by side in the last days. One's God and one's the devil. God said, I set before you life and death. You get to choose. Mm -hmm. I want you to choose me. I don't want to make you like me. God, God can do that with the angels. That's why a third of the angels rebelled. God, I don't make you. You have free will. God says, when I recreate mankind, I want people who have an opportunity and willingly choose me. That's why the oldest book of the Bible is Job. It's probably one of the greatest books of the Bible. Job was just, God set Job up. Job's blessed, filthy, stinking rich, man, lots of cattle, lots of sheep, wife sucking lips off his face, all of his kids are healthy and doing really good. And uh, the devil's walking through heaven one day, and God asked the devil, where have you been? Satan said, I've been walking to and fro, back and forth in the earth, looking for somebody to devour. Now, this is this is the archangel of archangels. You know, he had Michael, Lucifer, and Gabriel. So Lucifer was the head poncho angel. He got fired mm -hmm. and took a third of the angels with him. So when he get cast down the earth, he's looking for something to tear up. He, he hates everybody. And so God said, God set Job up. God said, he said, I'm looking for somebody to devour. He said, have you considered my servant Job? God set Job up. Have you considered my servant Job? I said, what? Yeah. Well, sure. Sure, Job loves you. You've blessed his socks off. He's filthy, stinking rich. Got all those cattle and sheep and all that land and all those servants. His wife's sucking the lips off his face. All of his kids are healthy. And man, sure. You take that stuff away from him, though, he'll deny you. And God said, go ahead. But you can't kill him. You can do anything you want to, but you can't kill him. 
Nobody likes Job. Nobody understands Job. But it's one of the greatest books of the Bible. It's how things started. So Job was kind of like, uh, oh, he was kind of like uh, John the Baptist. There's few people that are like him. You know, Jesus said John the Baptist was the greatest man ever born to a woman. Who is he? Well, it's camel hair, bug-eating guy, knocking people out of the water. It's just very different. God set him up because God does, he wants this. God says, I want people that want me. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to set you up, and you get to choose. It's very good. There's life, and there's prosperity, and there's blessing if you choose me. But every day, every day. It's not the military. And I love the military because it had security, I guess. But, you know, uh, I remember when I was just a private and private first class. Then I was a corporal, and then I'm a sergeant. You know, The longer you serve, the more stripes you got on your sleeve. There are no stripes in the body of Christ. God doesn't care how long you serve him. Every morning's a brand new day. You get to choose again to serve God, to fear God, and follow God. And so there's just choices all the time, every day. I don't care how people say, well, I've served God for 50 years. Well, tomorrow's a new day. You can go stupid tomorrow if you want to. There's no tenure in the body of Christ. So God wanted a relationship. He set it up so it will always be a relationship. There's no shortcut every day. Well, and also, I think uh, a family is uh, when a man and a woman come together. Priority. And, yeah, so I think you have to restructure your priorities. And uh, because, like you say, when you're speaking a lot, uh, children are passing through. (laughs) passing through. That God gave them to you for you to give them back to God. Now, look, listen, we dropped our first baby. I knew I went to the bottom of the food chain. It was obvious. My wife didn't tell me. I just knew. Baby's priority. Baby cries, baby laughs, baby squirrels, baby messes bitches. That baby is number one in this household. Well, then we had two, then we had three, then we had four, then we had five, then we got six. And I'm not even on the food chain anymore. Uh, my wife was consumed raising, feeding, educating, inoculating, you know, getting to pass out. It's an ongoing 24 hour day deal. But I did realize some people used to get on to us because all of our kids played sports and music. I said, man, you're too busy. I said, well, I only have them for about 18 years. You know, I plan to live a long time in my life. All my family live long. So if I'm normal in my family, I'll be at least 90, 95 before I go to heaven. And so I only have them for 18 of that. And so God gave them to me. My job is to train them up and give them back to God. So right now, yes, they are the new priority. Now, what you have to do on a regular basis, um, I told my kids, uh, you know, I still had to learn how to date my wife. You know, once a week, we go out for, we might just go to Starbucks and drink a coffee. We might go to McDonald's just to eat a Big Mac. We might just go out and do nothing except walk around the house. But we still had to date. And they had to realize, this, you're not the priority in this family. Uh, this lady's the priority in my life. She's number one. You're down the food chain. Uh, and people laugh when I tell that about our oldest daughter one time. I said, listen, Mom, not we're forever. You're just passing through. Now, you are a priority, and I want to help you in every way I can. But Mom's the priority. And so they needed to see that and hear that in some way. And so sometimes they'd pit that against one another. So, well, you know, <laughs> we would do it. Well, go ask your dad. Go ask your mom. And so my wife and I had to learn, no, we make agreements together. We don't go to a back room. We would settle most everything with the kids looking. Mom said I could. You said I can't. I said, okay, here's, tell me why they need to be able to do this. And sometimes I'd usually change my mind. Okay, I understand. That's good. You can go do that. And then sometimes, no, uh, mom doesn't want that. We're not going to do that. So you're still the core of the family, but these children are gifts from God given to you for a temporary amount of time to train up and give back to God. So they're not the center of your world, but right now they are the focus of your world. And so, But they need to understand this, my spouse, is still the center of my life, not you. You're very important to me. I love you. I, we birthed you, bathed you, taught you how to talk and walk. You are a big focus, and so we've, we've joked about it so many times. Oh, when our kids got married, I said, put your door key in my hand. Don't come back to my house unless I invite you. I love you. I fixed your crooked teeth, sent you to private school, private college, paid for your wedding, paid for your honeymoon, bought your first two cars. I, I love you. I got the cancel checks to prove I love you, but you are not number one in my life. My spouse is number one in my life. You're a close number two, but you're not number one. You will never be number one, ever. That's not biblical. <laughs> so you just kind of got to get the fences up and say, where, where it is? Well, for these next 18 years, it's just going to be a busy time, and you're going to have to make your time for each other. You're going to go on a date. You can't wait till it's convenient. It'll never be convenient. You have to make it happen on purpose. So, Yeah, and I think uh, our media has certainly changed the dynamics of the family. Uh, I mean, besides divorce, 
blended families and everything certainly has changed things yes. too. But I mean, even, uh, you know, you watch TV now, the kids seem to be smarter than the parents. The parents <laughs> yeah. are dumb. They talk to them crazy. I just don't like that at all. Nope. And so it's, it's, a, it's just a kind of a slow infiltration. And, uh, so, you know, I think, like you said, you need to take that time to date, set aside, uh, uh, spend time together. And it's okay for the kids not to be 24-7. Yes. You're all consuming and all consuming in your finances. It's okay yes. to set a standard and priorities. So, I mean, I think you have to, to have a balance. You got to have fences. They're constantly being adjusted, repaired, and mended. Because if you don't, when those kids turn 18, and you Ooh. you you know the door closes and they're out the door on their way to college. Then you're looking at your spouse going, "Who <laughs> who are you?" Well, you know, divorce is highest when the oldest child leaves home. That's when the highest divorce rate is among all marriages, young, older. When's the highest divorce rate? When the when the last kid leaves home because you realize I've fallen out of love. Mm-hmm. I've been so consumed with my kids and not taking time for my spouse. That's good. Mm. All right. Well, thank you so much, everybody, for listening today. Uh, please send your questions and comments to mail at joemcgeeministries.com. We sure love you. We'll Hope you have to, a great week. Look forward to hearing from you guys. God bless. Hey, thanks for listening today. Be sure to join us Monday, Wednesday, and Friday to hear more of what God can do in your life. He's got a great future for you and your family, and we are here to help you get there. Make sure and go to our website, joemcgeeministries.com. We've got all sorts of materials, books, DVDs, you name it all there to help you, your marriage, and your family succeed.